Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our King, Jesus, who rules on high for our benefit. Our sermon text for this evening comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, beginning in verse 7 through 16. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head. That is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What does the word or the, the concept end game mean? For those of you who are younger or into comic books, the word end game was used for the end of phase three of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was Avengers end game. And so many movies have been building to this moment. They had all of these solo shows about Thor, Iron Man, about character after character building groups like the Guardians of the Galaxy, all of these origin stories and then crossovers. And, and finally this team had assembled multiple times. But this one was bigger than all the rest. As all the teasers and pieces were hinting at this great big bad guy named Thanos who was looking for these infinity stones that could wipe out 50% of all living things in the entirety of the universe. And so it was the job of these superheroes to come up with an end game, an all or nothing strategy to save the universe. Spoiler alert. There's a phase four. So they did a good job. But it was risky, it was scary, and it looked like all hope was lost. And yet somehow, through the clutches of evil, they escaped and triumphed. Now maybe some of you don't care about that at all. But when you think of endgame, you think about the origin of that term. It's a chess term. Chess has been around for about 1,500 years in different forms, coming, they think, from India originally, and then into the Persian Empire, and then into, eventually, Europe, and closer to the form that we know today than to the Americas. But the term endgame is a strategy of pretty much sacrificing looking like you're going to fail in order to achieve checkmate. It's a very risky play. End game is an all or nothing strategy. You either win or you lose. There's no going back. And if you lose, it's going to look ugly. 
And for many world champion chess players, it looked as if they had just thrown away everything that they had worked towards. But somehow, it squeaked out the wind. My goal tonight is to help convince you that Jesus' endgame is the most brilliant one of all. That sometimes Jesus and God the Father, in their wisdom, have planned out our salvation in such a way that it looks as if he has sacrificed all his advantages and all of his pawns and all of his powerful pieces for a play that's not going to work. And I think the ascension sometimes feels that way. Jesus had everything going, and yet he threw it all away to ascend and leave us to our own devices. And that because of that, the church has struggled. If only Jesus had made a better move and stayed right here where we could see him, everything would be better. But tonight we're going to see that in the scriptures, through Jesus' own words and through Paul, that he makes a very powerful case explaining why it was better by far for him to ascend, to take his place at the right hand of God and fill the whole universe and to send us in his place. But first, some of the questions, like me, I've asked a lot of questions around the ascension. I wonder why it's not better for Jesus to be here face to face. First, for the cause of evangelism. We think in our minds it would be easier to tell people about Jesus if he was right here standing next to me. I could literally point to him and say, this is the guy who rose from the dead and look, he is still alive here 2,000 years later and doesn't he look good? It seems like that would work really well as an evangelism strategy. The man himself in the flesh here. Or even for the Christian church, if we could call him up on FaceTime, on our phones, and we could see Jesus' face and say, hey Jesus, I have a question for you. I'm really struggling with this. Do you understand me? And he would look with compassionate eyes back through the screen and say, yes, I love you. And I think you're on the right track. Thank you, Jesus. That seems like that would be very comforting, right? If we could do that and see him face to face. That that might even be better than what he has given us. A couple of other objections that I've thought about throughout the years is this. When questions of doctrine arise among us, when we're wondering what's right and wrong, what does the Bible actually mean? Wouldn't it be nice to ask him? directly and get it from, he's not a horse, but the horse's mouth, it would be nice to ask him directly like that, wouldn't it? Or this one, what about big cultural debates and earthly rulers? What about if we could ask Jesus directly which candidate we should vote for? Wouldn't that be nice? If we knew exactly what the best choice would be, considering all the factors and everything involved and all the behind the scenes stuff that we don't even know, the people who would ultimately benefit from that choice, I would love to ask him some questions, put my own conscience at ease. Those are tough questions, aren't they? And they have left me wondering, wouldn't it have been better if Jesus would have been here? among us, walking and talking just like he did with the disciples. <laughs> it sure sounds nice, doesn't it? There's so many questions like that. And in many ways, Jesus has moved to ascend only 40 days after rising from the dead. Seems a little bit confusing. <coughs> He's at a very high point, isn't he? Forty days after the resurrection, what could you say about Jesus? And I I think this is part of what the disciples were probably wondering as they were staring into the sky and thinking, seriously, right now? (laughs) 
at this moment, and they just before had asked, are you at this time going to establish your kingdom, Jesus? It seems like the perfect time. I mean, you just conquered the Romans. They brought out all the stops. They killed you in the most excruciating way, the way that they punish dangerous enemies. And yet you rose again three days later. What is more triumphant than that? And on top of that, you've appeared to us, you've appeared to 500 other believers at one time, you've continued to appear. Why don't we keep this victory train going and keep appearing to people? How can they contradict what they see with their own eyes and touch with their own hands and share a meal with the Savior himself? But then he says, you stay in Jerusalem. It's not for you to know the times and dates that my Father has set for the kingdom of God to come. But you wait, and I promise you that the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, will come to you and He will help you. He will empower you to be my witnesses, not only in Jerusalem, not only right here in Israel, not only in Judea, but also in Samaria. Yes, in Samaria, the place we visited a few times. And I told you the gospel was for them too, <clears throat> but to the ends of the earth. I have much bigger plans, my brothers and sisters, for those ladies that were there. Jesus had bigger plans, but they didn't understand it yet. And I don't think we always consider all the things that Jesus was planning to do from that moment on. See, to Jesus, this was just the beginning. And now it was time for his next big, brilliant move in his end game strategy. Already confusing with his death, which seemed like failure, but then had become great victory as he gained the forgiveness of sins for us through his death, new life and salvation, and now came phase two of his confusing yet amazing end game strategy. First, the faint. Jesus kind of makes it seem like he's gone. <coughs> He tells his disciples, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He physically disappears, and even those who follow him think, now what? And you can imagine maybe even some of Jesus' enemies as he stops his appearances over those next 10 days, and the disciples are hiding. The Pharisees are probably thinking, finally, maybe this rumor will die. Maybe this movement will end. Maybe these disciples will dissipate from here and be afraid and we'll never hear from them again. Jesus pretends for a moment that his church is going to end. But then, ten days later, Jesus sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And what begins. Exactly what Paul tells us in our text. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. At that moment, Jesus' physical presence in that way was removed. His mission on earth to be our Savior who walked and lived the perfect life in our place was finished. His death had been accomplished. His resurrection was done. Now all of that completion of the payment and the full reimbursement to God had been done. Now it was time to move into the mass assembly line 
sending out and preaching of the gospel. And it was better, God knew it was better, for him to go to heaven to fill the whole world and universe with his presence and to empower human beings like you and me with that gospel through the power of the Spirit, empowering us through faith to multiply a million-fold the work he had been doing in one place at one time in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. They say hindsight is 2020. And a lot of times when you look back, you're like, oh yeah, I guess I can see that. I guess I can see how that worked out. The problem with our hindsight is we never see the full picture, do we? Remember those questions? Wouldn't it be better if Jesus was here so that he could answer this question? We could physically see him. We could call him. But what about these questions? Isn't it better that Jesus has gone to heaven? He sends his Holy Spirit to fill us with faith, to teach us to understand everything he did for us and empowers us to know Him and believe in Him through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He removes that local presence so that He can be present with us everywhere. That He can fill our hearts and minds in every corner of the earth throughout time. That He can come to us in His physical presence in a, in a different way, in His body and blood here at the sacrament to be poured out and given for us, each of us, individually. So Jesus is with us. And yet from heaven He rules all things. And in God's wisdom, He says, it is better that you learn to know Me by faith instead of just by sight. That your faith will actually grow stronger as you listen and hear My word. And the Spirit empowers you to do something that is impossible for you. Believe. And even though it's harder sometimes to believe in something you can't see, that is the essence of faith. To believe in the one you haven't seen. To know the one that you have heard about and yet have not walked with physically. And yet, by the power of the Spirit, He has taught you to know God in a very intimate way that you still trust Him, that you are here today, that you and believers for the last 2,000 years have filled churches like this one, that millions, if not billions of people have believed in Jesus Christ because of the multiplying of representatives who have spoken that gospel throughout the world. Remember, Jesus didn't want His kingdom in just Jerusalem where he could be physically. He wanted his kingdom throughout the world. He told his disciples, you will begin an exponential growth. You will be the beginning of an assembly line. As you 12 are sent out, including Paul, and all the others who went out who saw him to preach the gospel throughout the world that Jesus died, he rose and he ascended to empower his people. Then those apostles taught pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets, those who speak God's word. And they then, it didn't stop there, because sometimes we do stop there. We think it's the pastor's job to preach God's word. It's the teacher's job to tell people about Jesus. It's others who are really passionate and good at talking. What does he say? This is only part of the assembly line. It keeps going. Their job, the pastors and teachers and evangelists and prophets, their job is to equip who? All people for works of service. All people. You. Every single person who hears the gospel, hears it and tells it. When Jesus comes to dwell in you, he compels you, just like he did the prophets of old, that if you keep your mouth shut about him, you don't tell others about Jesus and how he's taking your sins away, that he promises you eternal life 
and a kingdom forever in heaven. If you don't say that, you're going to explode. And think about how many people God is employing into his kingdom and the work that we are to do throughout the world when we look at it like that. Millions of people. Not just one man in one physical location, but Jesus Christ, who is still with us all throughout the world, uses his God presence of omnipresence to be everywhere with us every time we preach, every time we read the Bible, every time we pray, every time we talk to our kids and our neighbors about Jesus. He is there, effecting the growth of his church. Talk about the best pyramid scheme ever. <laughs> but it's not about you making money. It's about you giving thanks to God for the grace that you have come to know through a pastor, through a teacher, through your parents, through your friends and your neighbors, those who spoke the word of God to you. And you're so thankful that you know about that Jesus who came 2,000 years ago, that he was a real person that you may not see him with your eyes yet, but you will. When the gospel has gone to the ends of the earth. It's getting close. It's taken, taken 2,000 years so far. And it may take a couple more. Let's speed it up, shall we? Let's tell this generation. Let's tell the next generation. Let's get busy, each and every one of us, because, as he says, as we do that, we gain confidence. We grow up into Christ. We become mature as we take that seriously and we practice preaching it to others. We, as a body, help support and grow this church together. Each one of us. Notice, I'm not leaving you out. <laughs> I don't care what excuse is coming in your mind right now. God says each of us. And without you, we're missing something. We're missing a gift that you have, a talent you have, a passion you have for the gospel. I know the thought comes in, well, Jesus could do this a lot better than me. <laughs> in one sense, you're right. He's perfect. He's not going to mess it up. And we'll, we'll mess up. Sometimes we'll give the wrong impression. Sometimes we'll say something that we're not proud of. The beauty is, God's worked that all in to this brilliant endgame plan. He actually uses your weaknesses and your failures to make the gospel even sweeter. That's part of the plan. You are part of the plan. You are uniquely suited to preach the gospel. Because you can empathize with your fellow human beings who struggle with sin. You can tell the love of Jesus that he has given you for all of your failures. You can make clear all the holes that God has been stitching and fixing. You can, with tears in your eyes, tell someone why you cannot wait to get to heaven and for the kingdom of God to come. Are you starting to understand some of the brilliance of Jesus and God, the Father, as they concocted this plan all the way back at the beginning of time? You get to be part of the end game. You are a vital part of it. He planned it that way. As scripture says, he prepared in advance the works for us to do, for you to do, so that others may believe. And you may be mature. And in another place, he says, lacking nothing. And here he says, we will attain that whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Jesus says we will actually know him more fully by him being in heaven, ruling all things right now. That in the mystery of God, it is the perfect plan of God that we can't see him yet. And it'll make it just that much sweeter when we do. So my brothers and sisters, in the kingdom of God that is coming, let us boldly preach the gospel. Wherever we are, 
and whoever we are with the gifts God has given us. And let us have confidence that the King of heaven and earth, who died, who rose and ascended, rules all things on high. He sees all things, and he will not fail. He will win this phase just as he did the last one. And when that final day comes, the exact number of believers will be in his kingdom, standing next to you, rejoicing with the king that checkmate has been achieved. It is a glorious victory and a feast waiting for us. Let's run and not grow weary. Let us continue to work for the Lord and know that our labor is not in vain. Amen.